Second Peter, Second Peter chapter one. We're going to be reading verses one through nine. I am reading from and teaching from the New American Standard. That King James word will be just a tad bit different, but we'll all end up in the same place together. Second Peter chapter one, starting with the first verse. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord uh, Jesus our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who's called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he's granted us his precious uh, and magnificent promises, so that by them you may be partakers in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. For this very reason also, applying in diligence, in all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in self-control, perseverance, and in perseverance, godliness." And in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are, are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, speak to our hearts. Let us hear your voice and yours alone this morning. Ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I ask you a question this morning. Do you ever get to a place in your Christian life, in your walk with God, that you feel like sometimes I just can't do this? I just can't overcome this? I just can't quit this? And you look and say, you know, how in the world am I ever going to be the person that God has called me to be because I struggle with stuff? And maybe for all of us it's, it's something different. Maybe you struggle with uh, you know, somebody's hurt you and it's hard for you to forgive them. Maybe you struggle with uh, disappointment or maybe you struggle with, with uh, uh, you know, aggravation or anger. Maybe you blow off at the top of the, the hat, right? We all have issues that once we get saved, <clears throat> as Gracie come this morning to receive Christ last week as her personal Savior, as she comes today to be baptized in the baptismal waters, buried with Christ, raised a new creation, uh, we also understand that the exterior of us didn't get saved. The inner man did. The inner man got reborn, born again, but the outside of us, the shell in which we live in, is still subject to everything she was subject to before she went through the baptismal waters. Temptation and aggravation and frustration and anger and sadness and disappointment and all the things that come against us as humans we're still subject to once we get born again. And so then we so we say, look, you know, how in the world am I going to be a, a Christian, be a good Christian like, like Cuddy or, or like Mr. Bill? How am I going to be people like that who have lived out the faith, who are an example for me? And maybe sometimes you think you're never going to get there. Well, I got news for you this morning. I got some hope for you. That God has given us through His Word everything you need to be successful in this Christian walk. You've got everything at your disposal to be the person that God has called you to be. You've got everything you need to change your life. You've got everything you need to be a witness to the world that God has changed you. You've got everything you need to be that person that you look up to and say, how can they get there? How did they do it? You've got the same ability that they had through the Word of God. And so Peter writing uh, here in the book of 2 Peter, he uh, starts out with uh, in identifying himself, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. And look who he's writing to here. He says, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. What kind? By righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so he says, I'm speaking to you, believer. You that have accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. You that have believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. 
And I'm not talking about Baptist. I'm not talking about Methodist. I'm not talking about uh, Catholic or any of that. I'm talking about the person who has taken Jesus Christ at his word, has believed his message, who has received him into their hearts, that they have said, you know what? I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that Christ is, uh, that he is the Christ. He's the son of the living God. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that he died on the cross at Calvary. I believe that he died on the cross at Calvary for my sins, and I believe he paid my sin debt in full. And I voluntarily surrender my life, lay it down at the feet of Jesus, and I place my faith and trust in him. That's who he's talking to. Those that believe that Jesus is Lord. He said, okay, for all of you, he said, grace and peace be multiplied to you. How? In the knowledge of God. You see, this is what differentiates Christianity from any other religion in the world, is that other religions doesn't focus on the aspect of a personal relationship. For very well, you couldn't have one with somebody who's dead, and Mohammed is dead. Buddha is dead. All these other religious figures have come and gone and have died. But there is one on that, on that day uh, 2,024 years ago. They got up from the cross. They got up from the grave. They got up and he conquered death, hell, and the grave for you and I. We have one that is, the Bible says that after the, he uh, uh, arose from the grave, he was seen for about 50 days amongst hundreds of people. The Bible says that at the end of that time, he uh, he ascended up into heaven. He was he didn't die as far as uh, he did the first time. He came back to life, and when he left this earth, he was alive. He was living when he got called up into the heaven. And the Bible says that the Savior that we serve is alive and he's living today. He's sitting at the right hand of God the Father, praying for you and I. So listen, you and I do not serve a Savior that is dead. We don't serve a Savior who cannot hear us. We don't serve a Savior who doesn't have compassion for us. We serve a Savior that is alive in a well. He's sitting at the right hand of God. He sees your needs. He knows your heart. He knows your faults. He knows your problems. He knows your struggles. He knows your victories. He knows all about you. And when you stumble and when you fall and when you make a mistake, He is at the right hand of God praying for you and I, saying, Father, forgive them for they're covered in my blood. My blood is paid the price. So he wants to have a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with you and I. Amen. So what do you think about this one? How many of y'all have got adult kids? Raise your hand. Now, okay. Now, it wasn't too long ago that you had kids like... Alex and, and uh, them got back here. You hear him, right? Weston? Hey, Weston. You hear him? He don't mind talking. He don't mind talking. Now, we can't understand what he's saying, but he don't mind talking. But how many of y'all know that fast forward a few years on this little guy, He's going to grow up, and then trying to get him to talk, especially since he's a man, is going to be like pulling teeth. Right? Y'all know what I'm saying? Listen, here's a, here's a fact. I ran across a fact today. Ladies, don't be mad, but this is just the truth. You wonder why your man don't say a whole lot when he comes home at night. You ask him, how was your day? What does he say? Fine. <laughs> what would you do at work today? Nothing. There's a, there have been studies and research that on average, now listen to this, on average men use 7,000 words a day. 7,000. And so he, you know, when he's done, he's done. You know how many women use? <laughs> Not 14,000. On average, according to the study that I was reading this week, on average, women use per day twenty-five to 50,000 words. Yeah. <laughs> and y'all go shopping. And we, listen, we go shopping. Men go to Walmart. 
They know what they want. They need a pack of underwear. What do they do? They go straight to the underwear aisle. They get a pack of underwear. They go straight to the checkout style. Out the door they go. You guys go shopping. You ladies go shopping. And I've been with my wife. And this is exactly how it happens. She gets in the middle of the store. She gets in the, the clothing aisle. And she, here's what happened. Look at this. And 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 look at this. Look at this. Amen. And most men are over in the corner hollering, just buy something. Cutty, you got me? Yeah. Cutty, take Miss Charlotte to shopping, and he goes sit out in the car and sleep three days before she gets done. Because there's a difference. Men are... Listen, men don't have a lot of words to say. So when a man says his words, listen, he meant that stuff because it's a hassle for him to talk. But I think about that for just a minute. We have trouble talking, you know, when, when, when our children get older, we have trouble getting words out of them. And you get frustrated, why, why, why don't you talk to me? Why don't you tell me? Why don't you, you know, so your, your boyfriend or your, 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 whoever you're dating, your, your husband, your spouse, you look at him and say, why aren't you talking to me? Well, one, he's not wired that way. But two, it also reminds me about how sometimes I wonder how God thinks about us. Why don't you talk to me? I'm here. And even some of you ladies, when it comes to 50,000 words a day, I, uh, some of y'all probably don't use half of that to talk to God. You, do, you use a lot, lot 50,000 words, and you'll talk about everything. Well, this, this one here, and they, they went there, and they went there, and I can't believe he said this, and she said that, and they did this, and da 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 <laughs> But when it comes to talking to God, you, what I want you to understand this morning is that he is always willing to listen. He's not like your husband or your, your boyfriend. We have molds of us. Now, I'm going to tell a secret on all of us guys. And, and Pam, turn your ears off so you don't hear this right now. But we do have the ability, if we really want to be honest, men, we have this innate ability to turn you, give you the mute button. We can shut you out. My wife can be talking and I can be looking right at her and not hear a word she says. She said, and she and somehow or another she knows that too. She looked at me and she said, You didn't hear a word I said. And my response back is, huh? <laughs> it's the deer in the headlight. It's the deer in the headlight, look, yeah. I wonder how much God thinks that about us. Here is what you need to be successful. Me. That's what God says. Here's what you need to be successful, me. How are you going to be successful? Well, it says grace and peace multiply to you through the knowledge of God. Now, let's, let's look forward here for just a second. Verse 3. Verse 3. Seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the not true knowledge of him who's called us by his glory and excellence. Now, we understand twofold. That number one, that we get knowledge of God from the word of God. This is how you're going to figure out what the will of God is, is by knowing what the Word of God says. Now, listen, I'm going to tell you a little something. I'm not a stickler that says if you have to read, you have to read one version and, and that's the only version. I'm a, I'm a big believer. You get you what you can understand. Start there. I'd rather you read something that you don't under, that you can understand than reading something that's got big words in it and then just be reading it and not know what you're talking about. Now, I think that's a starting place. Get something that you can understand. Get a version of this that makes sense to you. Okay? And there's two types of, of writings. There's what's called a translation, word-for-word -word translation, and there's what's called a transliteration, which is not a word-for-word, -word, but it's, it's sort of summing up what the Scriptures say. Okay? Get you something you can understand and start spending time in here because this is the heart of God. This is, this is what God's will is for your life. You say, well, I don't know what God wants for me to do. Well, listen, if we just sit around all of our life and say, well, I don't know what God wants me to do, so I'm not going to do anything, 
here's what we can do. Here's the Word of God, and the Word of God is the will of God. And so we can start, how about this? The Bible says, love your neighbor as... How about we start there? Just start there. I'm going to start keeping everybody the best I can. I'm going to try. Huh? Just to... No. <laughs> try today. Start today. Tomorrow, today might be hard. And tomorrow might be a little easier. Right? But we, we've got to start somewhere. How do I change my life? How do I be a better person? How do I keep from losing my cool? How do I keep from telling people off? How do I do that? Well, I've got to start somewhere. I've got to recognize that this is the problem that I have. I have an issue here. I need to know how do I get better at this. So you name whatever it is. You name whatever it is, and then you get in the Bible. You can get on Google, the Google machine, and you can type in Bible verses for anger. And it'll pop up hundreds of Bible verses for anger. Type in Bible verses for telling people off. I don't know. That, that'll pop up something. And then, you know, Bible verses for road rage. Then, all right, so Monday morning, you've got some Bible verses, and when somebody cuts you off in traffic, instead of screaming, yelling, and flipping on a bird, you can quote a scripture. I don't know. Maybe you'll holler out in the car when you're going. There's a place called hell where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. But our, our knowledge of him is what gets us going, okay? So the travesty is this, is that there, are, there will be thousands of Christians that will live their Christian life that will never spend much time in this because they'll say they don't understand it or they don't understand what it's trying to say. I'm telling you, go find you the one that you understand. If it's a children's Bible, that's okay with me too. I want you to understand it and then start applying it to your life. Because I want you to see what he says here. He says, seeing that his divine power has granted us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. And it comes through the knowledge of God. So you've got everything you need to be the Christian God's called you to be. And it's found right here. Okay, That's the first start. Now, the second start is I take this, and let's say I'm, at, I'm, I'm trying to overcome something, whatever it might be. Let's say road rage, okay? I'm trying to overcome road rage. And I get in the, I get in the truck, I'm headed out to town, and here comes Danny Duckworth with a load of gravel running 500 miles an hour. Get out of my way. And he gets over just a little bit too far. I get my tires off on them little things on the side of the road. You know, when you hit the tire things on the side of the road. All right, what's my natural reaction going to be? I'm going to fuss. Right? But if I'm packed myself with some scripture, I can choose to do something different. I could say, a, thank you, God, that I was saved. Thank you, God, that uh, you took care of the matter. Thank you, God, that there was no accident here. Thank you, God, that everything, this is going to be a good day. Some of y'all wake up on Monday morning, and it's like, my Lord, rolling you out of bed, and you look, what? good morning, what's so good about it? Get me a cup of coffee. Maybe you look at it when you wake up the next morning, and maybe one of the things you do is take a scripture that says, this is the day the Lord has made. I shall what? Rejoice and Okay. Because the Bible says faith comes by, you know what it said? Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So if faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, guess what also comes? Doubt. And doubt comes by hearing anything other than the word of God. And so many of us are inundated on a daily basis with negative, doubtful stuff, right? Turn on the news. Never going to get ahead. Gas price is high. Loaf of bread's this. Eggs are that. Gasoline. Electric bill. All this stuff. Inflation. And the doubt creeps in and says, I am never going to get ahead. Faith comes in by saying, according to the book of Philippians, 
My God will supply all of my needs. This stuff has to be in me so that when I need it, I can pull it out of me and then I can make a declaration that, you know what? It's going to be all right. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what? Do you hear that? The echo from beyond. Think about it for just a minute. We are supposed to be using this stuff that way. And so when your husband comes home, and he's had a bad day, and he's hungry, and he's cranky, and he looks like a grizzly bear that's just woke up from hibernation, and he says, where's my food, woman? You just look at him and quote the Bible and says, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> God has given you everything you need to be successful. All right? Say this with me. God, God has, given has given me. me. Do it again. God, God has, given has given me. me. Everything, Everything I, need I need to be the Christian, be the Christian. He, wants me to be. he wants me to be. It's in the Word of God. Now here's the problem. I'm just going to be honest with you. Here's the problem. There's a miracle drug that's come out here just not too long ago. I don't know what they're all the name. There's three different shots that you can take and they found out that they used it for diabetes, but they found out that it was sort of a miracle drug that if you took this stuff, you lost all kinds of weight, right? It meant you didn't have to exercise. You didn't have to do all the normal traditional things that you used to have to do to get what the results you used to have to get. Now you can take this injection, and lots of people have lost weight with it. The problem is we really don't know what the long-term side effects are because it hasn't been studied long enough, right? So maybe 20, 30, 40 years from now, we'll find out that it was indeed a miracle drug. Maybe we find out that it wasn't very good and it hurt people. I don't know how that's going to work out. But I noticed that when everybody started losing weight, everybody who needed to lose weight started going to the doctor, asking the doctor, well, would this shot work for me? Why? Because it's easier to do something real quick and get a quick result. I think it's the same thing with the Bible. We look at the Bible and say, you know what, well, I just don't have time. I, you know, I'm busy. I, I don't have time to sit down because I've always got something to do. Understand that, that what I'm asking of you to improve your life will take time, and it will take effort. Just like going to the gym, you go to the gym, you've never worked out before in a day of your life, and, you know, you look like Puff the Stay Marshmallow Man you know, on Ghostbusters. You look like the Puff Marshmallow Man. Don't expect to go to the gym the first day and come out of there looking like a, 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 a seasoned bodybuilder. It's not going to happen. You're not going to lose, the, you, you need to lose 100 pounds. You're not going to go to the gym, run the treadmill for 20 minutes, and guess what? 100 pounds fell off. If that did, there's something wrong. You're probably sick. What that effort takes is day after day after day of intense, intentional consistency, getting up, putting your gym work clothes on, going to the gym, lifting weights, spending time out of your schedule, and after years, you get the result that you've been looking for. I think so many people want this to be done so quick that they get frustrated because they don't see immediate results and then it's like, well, I don't have time. I, you know, sure you got time. Evaluate. How much time do you spend at night watching television? How much time do you spend at night on that little black box that's called a cell phone? Do you play, playing games? My wife was at, up at 4 o'clock this morning. I'm going to tell her. She waited up for me to get home from the football game. I got home about the, one, between 1.30 and 2 last night. And I, I drifted off and woke up to the light of the cell phone. And she was playing some sort of coloring coloring at four in the morning on her cell phone. We spend a lot of time and we don't, we don't even think about how much time we spend. 
that if we put that kind of effort into our relationship with God, hey, let me give you this one, men. If we put that kind of effort into our relationships with our woman, how much better will our lives be? You see, it's not a matter that we don't have time. It's a matter of how we prioritize it. And it's a matter of what's important to you. And I'm at the place in my life, I'm a half a century next week. Okay. Yeah. I'm at the place in my life that I realize, I, you know, half a century, I'm probably not going to make it to 100. And I may not make it to 80, maybe. But I probably got more behind me than I do ahead of me, if you really think about it. So the question then becomes, how do I want to finish? And I don't want to finish with the same mentality and the same attitude as a teenage boy. You should be like that. You should be like that. Fuss and cuss and carry on. Be aggravated and mad at the world. Fuss. I rip more t-shirts, flannel shirts, rip them apart. I don't Pam make me mad. I get mad. I just... I broke more remote controls, throwing them against the wall, being mad about something. I throw more tools, being frustrated, trying to work on something, and I couldn't get it to work. Y'all ever do that, trying to work on something? I was trying to hang a light one time, and I climbed the ladder on the side of the house. I climbed that 16-foot ladder to get to the top of the house to hang a light. Every time I got to the top of the ladder, I dropped something. Back down the ladder, I went. I got the tool that I dropped, went back up the ladder, get at the top of the ladder, start, but boop, there it goes again. Finally, Pam left the house that day. I took the ladder, the tools, and all of them and just threw them out into the yard. Well, I'm at the, I'm at the back side of things now, and I don't want to finish the way I started. I want to finish better. I, I want people to, when they stand at my casket, say, my life was a little better off because he was in it. And the only way I know to get there in a world that is so desperately dark and evil is to stay with a formula, formula that has worked for thousands of years. 2,000 as a matter of fact. And that is following Jesus Christ and His word. Let me ask you a question and I'm going to get you out of here. If this was it, if this was it, and God called you home, would you be satisfied with what all you've gotten out of your relationship with Christ up until now? Or is there more that you know you say, you know what, I really need to, I need to be better at this, and I need to get over this, and I need to add this. There's some things before I leave here, I want to add to my church. I want to be a man that's patient, a man that's after God's own heart. I want to be a man that uh, that that God, when 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 people look at me, they say, you know what? I know he's not perfect, but I know who he belongs to. I want people to look at me and say, you know what? I know he's faithful. I know that I can trust him. I know his word means something, not because I'm good, but because the one I follow is good. And I place my trust in you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here's the bottom line. We got two choices today. We can leave here transformed. We can leave here transformed by accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We can leave out of here help with a helper that will help us get over being angry, being frustrated, being aggravated. Young man, you don't have to live that way anymore. It's not beneficial to your family. It hurts. It hurts the people that you're around. Get rid of your anger. Young lady, it's okay. Trust God. Put your faith in Him. Be the mom. Be the wife. Be the, the spiritual person in your house that God's called you to be. But you got the choice to be transformed by changing your life with the Word of God, following Him for the very first time, or walking right back out of here facing a life that is desperate and dark and, and has no hope. You say, well, you know what, preacher, the world's a bad shape, yeah, but you know what? I'm not worried about what happens in two weeks. I'm because you know what, no matter what happens in two weeks, I still got a king. His name is Jesus. He's still on the throne. 
Everything's going to be all right in the way I see it. The world's dark and they're looking for answers, but the answers have been here the whole time. The question is, do you do this and find the answer? Or do you walk out of here frustrated the rest of your life? And that choice is yours. And if that choice is for you to make, it's to make today and it's to make it wiser. Let's stand our feet. Every head bowed, every eye closed across the room this morning. You're here this morning. Everybody's head bowed, everybody eye closed. I don't want to embarrass anybody. You're here this morning. And you're not a believer. And you're tired of being frustrated, disappointed, aggravated with life. It's time to do something different. You're here this morning and you don't know Jesus. Would you say, preacher, I am so ready for a different way of living. Would you pray for me? Slip your hand up and just write back down. I'm just going to pray. You're here this morning and you're a believer. But what I'm talking to you resonates because you spend more time watching TV than you do the Word of God. You spend more time complaining about the problem than you are finding the solution to the problem in the Word of God. God wants to change you, but you've got to, you've got to take those steps to pray, talk with Him, get in the Word. If you're here this morning, you need to be saved. The pew over here by this piano is open. I'd ask you to come and sit on it. And I'll come down and lead you through the sinner's prayer and we'll ask God to forgive you for sins and come in your heart. And just as all others have over the last weeks and months and years here, they have found forgiveness in Christ and a fresh start and a new beginning. If you need that this morning, I'm going to ask you when the invitation is played to come and just sit on that pew. For the rest of us, the altar's open. What do you need to lay down today? What do you need to surrender? What do you need to ask Him to help you with? What is it you need to start doing to make the life that you live be have everything you need for life and godliness through the Word of God? What do you need to surrender, lay down, pick up? What do you need to do? Only you know that. You need to trust Him where you're at right now. Father, speak to our hearts. You know our hearts. You know what we're dealing with. You know the ones that need to be saved. You're, you're messing with their hearts right now, Father. Give them the courage to step out and sit on this pew. For the ones who need to lay down some stuff, give them the courage. Speak to us. Let us leave here changed by the power of the blood of the Lamb. In Jesus' name.